Uh, my name's Janet Wagstaff. I'm currently the Director of Law Access New South Wales. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet on Gadigal land. Um, Law Access New South Wales uh, sits within the Department of Justice, New South Wales Department of Justice, um, but it is an interestingly unique uh, model in that its funding does not come completely from that source. Um, from its, its first being set up in 2001, it has a, a mixed model of funding. So we receive funding and in-kind support from the department and we receive funding from the PPF and we receive some funding from Legal Aid New South Wales. Um, the PPF funding has obviously, as with many other organisations that receive that source of funding, has uh, taken a bit of a dive in recent years. What is PPF, sorry? Public Purpose Fund. Oh, thank you. My apologies. Um, which, of course, is uh, lawyers' money. Um, the fund has experienced some difficulties. Uh, the model that Law Access was set up upon for its funding and its structure, um, in, in retrospect and hindsight, perhaps not as wise as it seemed at the time, um, because the, the PPF, the Public Purpose Fund, uh, became really the major source of, of funding for law access and the other the other parties involved in setting the service up probably became very reliant upon that. So Law Access New South Wales, as I say, was set up in 2001. Uh, it was an initiative of the then New South Wales Attorney General's Department, Legal Aid New <coughs> South Wales, the Law Society of New South Wales and the New South Wales Bar Association. These organisations collaborated to set up a single entry point for people seeking help with a New South Wales legal problem. So at heart, this is a triaging service. It's not meant to centralise, it's meant to be the entry point. Um, and set up in a way and continues to operate in a way that is, suggests that it can never be the wrong door. So whilst there are some problems and issues that we can't necessarily provide direct assistance with, we will try and refer the person on to a service that can. So we provide managed referrals, legal information, and in some instances, legal advice. So how do we determine whether somebody should have advice? Advice makes up about 10% of our total uh, number of customers assisted every year. So. Unfortunately, those numbers have reduced with our reduced resourcing, but um, for example, um, at our peak uh, in the 2013-2014 financial year, we assisted over 205,000 customers in that year, and we provided um, probably about 19 or 20,000 sessions of legal advice. So that Unfortunately, in 2015, 2016 was reduced to 122,623 customers assisted, but we still managed to keep up to 10% or more of those being assisted with legal advice. Why was that reduction? We were required to find um, over $800,000 worth of savings um, because of the reduction in, in public purpose funding. So that meant letting go of our clerkship program it uh, meant reducing our casual pool to almost nil and also cutbacks in staffing. So literally at the end of the day, there were just less people able to take the calls. So the demand didn't reduce, but the, the number of abandoned calls did um, and the number of people we were able to actually get to and assist was, was reduced. When you say abandoned calls, people have just given up. Hung up, yep, hang ups, pure and simple. And we have no way of knowing, like was was in excess of, um, 91,000 hang-ups in 2015-16 compared to 27,000 in 13-14. Um, we have no way of estimating how many of those people successfully called back, uh, went to another service, got their help online. We've got no way of knowing, but we, we know that there must be a number of them who just gave up and we couldn't provide assistance. But what do we aim to do? We, um, I think, have a, a incredibly good model and it has been acknowledged by the um, Productivity Commission 
as a template that could be copied by other states and territories. New South Wales led the way with this model. Um, it successfully assists you know, large numbers of people, not just with those that we um, answer the phone to, but people who go to our website and use our resources. Uh, we set up, um, well, not me personally, I came to law access from a long career in courts and ministerial work um, a few years ago, but in about probably around 2007, 2008, um, additional funding was provided to set up what was then called Law Assist. We've recently changed the name to Representing Yourself, which is um, a part of the website that is specifically dedicated to assisting people who are representing themselves in proceedings. Now, this could be representing themselves because they simply can't afford representation, or it could be because there really is no choice. Um, some matters, as we know, are simply not worth a lawyer's time and effort. Um, but many people are sort of, you know, don't have the skills. So we try and assist them with that. Um, as far as our priority customer groups go, and that would be, you know, very typical categories of people that are acknowledged as being disadvantaged, um, the homeless, those at risk of being homeless, Aboriginal communities, um, people in remote rural and uh, regional locations, um, people at risk, prisoners, etc. Uh, they automatically, we deem them to be priority customers, which means if they do require legal advice, we can provide it if it is in one of the categories that we're able to assist, which is essentially civil, family law and crime. Um, specialist services um, exist that we can refer people to otherwise. Um, we are finding that we have an increasing demand for legal advice. We do refer to CLCs, we do refer to legal aid, we do refer, um, we don't refer to private firms directly, but we do use the Law Society's referral system to get people to a private lawyer if they need one. Um, and that takes away that sort of any element of um, favouritism or preference. There's a lot of governance around what we do and a lot of structure and discipline. And I think that's at the heart of what makes it so successful is that um, we've never strayed out of our um, original brief, which was to provide free telephone assistance for people with a New South Wales legal problem and to provide online resources. If, if very good, helpful resources already exist, we don't reinvent them. We don't step into other people's areas of work, you know, we work closely with organisations such as Women's Legal and um, CLC's New South Wales Legal Aid and um, pro bono services, just so we know what's going on out there and we know what is worth referring people to and what is not. We, we get contacted by organisations who've set up an online service. Uh, we'd love you to put a link to our service on your website. We usually take a very long, detailed look at it and we say no, because, you know, um, anything with the word express in it or, you know, something along the lines of I can't believe it's a law firm is not really likely to be providing the kind of assistance that we want people to get. Um, so we keep that discipline. We have a rule in the contact centre, if you can't source it, you can't say it. So if it doesn't exist as a resource created by our lawyers, our lawyers create our internal resource, Law Prompt, um, if it's not on our website, if it's not on the customer um, relationship management system, if it's not a hard copy resource that we provide for them, then you can't say it. So at that point, you put the customer on hold, you go and consult with a team leader or a lawyer and ask them, what do I do with this person? Here's their issue. And you can go back and preempt what you say with the words or prefix it with, I have consulted with a senior colleague who tells me that you can do this. So we try to keep it very disciplined, very structured. Um, I mentioned before that we had a clerkship program. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to put that on hold um, because we don't have the resourcing to fund it at the moment. But what we were doing for students, for law students who were in their final or penultimate year, was providing um, an opportunity for them to apply to join our clerkship program. We took on about nine or 10 FTE. Um, 
full-time equivalent, they were uh, put through a training program, an induction of two to three weeks. They were then given part-time work on the phones. Um, they were able, obviously, to continue with their studies while they did that. And then at the end of their 12-week program, they could elect to remain on as a casual, which many of them did. Um, they learned really incredible practical skills in that time. And they all, without exception, went on to win legal roles, whether it was in the department or other parts of the public sector or private firms or um, CLCs, legal aid. Uh, they have, we've got a, a whole list of alumni who have gone on to secure very good jobs and a lot of that was about what they learned working at Law Access. Are these clerkships paid positions? Or were yes. they paid positions? Yes. Yeah, they were. Yes. The department frowns on um, internship style employment. They, they, they fear being accused of, of slave <laughs> labour, I suppose. Um, I don't think they'd mind me saying that. I think they're, they're very careful to protect the, the image that they want to portray as an employer and they don't really like you to take on uh, volunteers. Uh, they would rather that you gave them a paid position that would, whether it's temporary or ongoing, that would give them an opportunity to learn and train. How long had that clerkship program been running? Um, it pretty much came into being a couple of years after Law Access kicked off. So Law Access um, started operations in 2001, I think it was about 2003 that they started the clerkship program. Initially it was started up um, following on from what the Law Society used to do with their telephone service, which we took over when we were created. Um, they found that the summer period was um, often one of high demand. Uh, but low availability of staff. So they did something similar at the Law Society. So we, we copied that model and expanded upon it. And that helped to cover that you know, high demand, low staffing period of Christmas New Year. Um, it was so successful that they decided to extend it to winter. So we ran a summer and a winter clerkship. So there were two programs a year for several years. But unfortunately, as I say, since 2013, it's been suspended because um, we had to make cutbacks. Um, but we are working on um, strategies to deal with this reduced resourcing. Some involve technology, some involve just changing the way we do things, and we are slowly but surely bringing up our, our numbers again. Um, whether we'll ever get back to what we did, is, we don't know. We'll try. Have you been required to make uh, save or find savings for the 2016-17 financial year? Um, we haven't been set a specific target but we have been asked to include in our draft business plans uh, what savings we feel we... Efficiency will, dividends. Yes, will achieve. Yes. Which from our perspective, we have just moved to a new telephony platform. So we've gone into the cloud mm. and um, we do anticipate that that will ultimately start delivering some savings. You know, we've had some initial cost outlay. Um, one of the technology um, solutions I mentioned uh, came by virtue of that new platform, which is we, um, I've authorised a purchase of a clip-on, which will allow automated callbacks. And previously we couldn't provide callbacks because we didn't have the resources for somebody to sit aside or however many clerks you need to sit aside and return calls. Um, you don't know how much of a demand you're going to get on that option. But with the automated callback, they will be given an option to be called back and the system will automatically call them back and then connect them with an agent. So we're hoping that will reduce uh, the hang-ups. Initially, if only for people on mobile phones, what we've discovered is that many of our really disadvantaged people, those in regional areas particularly, um, rely solely upon a prepaid mobile phone to access services. And um, you can't wait for 10 or 15 minutes in a queue on a prepaid mobile when you're living on Centrelink benefits. So we're trying to help those people first and foremost. And we're trying to redirect a lot of people to the website who can self-serve. Um, and we're also involved in some, uh, in a project to try and improve our website and connect people up with other services more readily. Where's the area of greatest need? Not in terms of your finances, I, I understand that. You but in terms in of your, those people accessing your service. You mentioned um, uh, regional areas are particularly disadvantaged. Mm. Um, we do gather statistics on 
our number of Aboriginal clients and customers and on those who contact us from outside the Sydney region. And we do find that typically, um, I'd have to check it off the top of my head, I think it's, it's anywhere between 30 and 40% we find are calling from outside of Sydney. Um, we have, as far as legal advice goes, we find about 8% of our total numbers are made up of Aboriginal people, um, which is, it's a good number. We, we want to assist those communities, um, but it is concerning at the same time when you consider that Aboriginal people only make up 3% of the population. So um, we provide two Aboriginal um, information officers in our contact centre and we give people the option to identify and to be to get a call back from that Aboriginal officer if they prefer and we also offer them to um, provide support in sessions of legal advice too um, which gets taken up reasonably often so we we feel that that's meeting a need um, so yeah the regions are definitely an area of high need um, I find that a lot of the committees I work on and working groups I'm involved with, which involve groups like Legal Aid and CLCs, they're talking more and more about the working poor. And so we feel there's an increasing number of people who are perhaps in that category of can't afford private legal representation um, or think that it's beyond their, their scope and need help. Um, so we're a little concerned about next year with the reduced funding to CLCs. Are there any particular types of legal problems that they're, they're coming to you to deal with? Is family law, domestic violence? Our top five invariably includes family law and relationships um, and property, property settlement, in, as particularly in respect to advice. Uh, and almost always in that top five, just generally seeking assistance, would you would include debt and fines. And the debt we will categorise in money owed to and money owed by, but and they usually sit. They'll occasionally overtake one another, but they sit side by side usually.